types of uh, contracts. Yeah, different types of uh, contracts and um, uh, when to use them in product because you know I never really thought about those different types. We just I just most times just use what is um, probably what has been in use in the company in the organization. We're getting to know about the different types now. At least I know I can leverage on based depending on which one is um, most needed at that time. Anyway, leverage on it for that time. So those different types of um, okay. contract, the, the fixed price, the cost, the reimbursement, and the rest. Let me not waste too much time on that. So thank you. Yeah, I, I really think that. Yes. Okay. Very good. Very good. Thank you so much. Lucy, Lucy, let's hear from you. Lucy, you can unmute now so you can speak. Okay. Yes, good afternoon, sir. Good afternoon, class. Good afternoon. Welcome. Bye. My take home from, from the last class was the pre-qualifier process. Um, that is a process for vetting a vendor before a job. Um, the process is used to measure suppliers' competence, um, ability, um, and some other stuff okay. like that. And there are quite a few of them. Um, I also learned about what makes a contract valid, which is an agreement, and the agreement could be written, that is express, and it could be implied. That yep. So that's my take home. Okay. Thank you. All right, let's hear from Fatima. Fatima, please go on. Yeah, good afternoon, class. Good afternoon. Take from the one of them are contract negotiations. Um, when to negotiate a contract, how to negotiate, and I need to understand that there is just we just don't negotiate money. We also have to negotiate the way the service, how we want it and how it should go, time bound. Also, I, my other takeaway was the red flags, especially when a service provider or vendor starts changing what was agreed before. That was my key takeaway. Okay, super. Thank you. Okay, let's hear from Debo now. Debo Ale, go ahead. It's you, yes, Debo Ale. <laughs> One take away from the class. You're muted, still muted. Are you talking to me, Lucy? Uh, Debo, I'll let you can speak now. <laughs> Come on, please. Can you, can you jump up past me? I should jump up as you. Okay. Oh, no, no, okay. <laughs> Thank you. And then take the mic. I'm coming to get you. out. <laughs> and then you can unmute and speak. Good afternoon, sir. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Okay, my take from the last class. Um, you said uh, FM, when it comes to procurement, FM are generally seen by people as thieves. That's a good takeaway. <laughs> so when, <laughs> no, 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 no. yes, I'm coming, please. <laughs> um, when it comes to procurement, we need to be very, very careful. Standard and ethics, very, very key. Right. When it comes to procurement. Right. So and by the time you procure, you don't just leave, you gather data and uh, you document. Exactly, thank you. Very good, thanks a lot for that. Let's hear from James, James Ame.
Hello, good evening, class. Good evening. Okay. My take from the last class was uh, uh, the, <clears throat> the need for outsourcing, why we need to outsource and the benefit as well. And also uh, uh, the difference between um, procurement and purchasing as well, so, and the different types of FM contracts. This way my take. Okay, very good. Yeah. Very good. So let's see who is in class again. All right, let's hear from Malayami. Yeah, good afternoon, sir. Good afternoon. Good afternoon, everybody. Good afternoon. Um, yeah, so I've, um, the last, uh, last class I took away, I was able to learn um, uh, the difference between procurement and uh, and uh, purchasing too. And also um, why in-house um, facility uh, service, the difference between them and then which the advantage that each one of them has and then uh, uh, compared to the other and the disadvantages too. I was also able to learn about, um, um, okay, the reason for outsourcing too. I learned about that too. I learned also about um, um, right, let me say value for money. Yeah. That is the right product, getting the right product at the right time uh, and at the right price. Very good. Yes, that's um, uh, value for money. I also was able to learn about um, um, FM procurement too. And then the tender, the processes that are involved in the tendering uh, one awesome. level to the other. All right, very good. Um, okay. So we've had, uh, has uh, Lucy spoken? Okay, I think Lucy has spoken. All right, so um, Haja, Oyekachi, Ramoni, um, Adeleye, Victor, Shakiru, David, um, Ade Adedayo. Do you want to come on, any of you, and say something about your takeaway from the last class? Have we heard from Fatima already? I think so, yeah. No. Yes, me. All right, yes. Theodora, you want to speak? Go ahead. Yes, um, um, two things really in um, my area. One of them, and the most important one, is that when we are outsourcing, it's that supposed to be a company that we think is fairly independent, so we don't give them a job and help them to take it. Very good. So you don't just right. to come and invest um, the investigator site, you give them information and a template to complete. Yeah. Right. And the second one is when we are doing a brief procurement for um, what we want, it should be price as it's like you want a, 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 a laptop and you know you want a HP laptop, you carry make sure you put everything that is the specification that you want, but mm -hmm. you don't write the name of the product. But then you know that kind of they're going to arrow down to what you want. Very good. Very good. Don't give them to swim and get all the kinds of fish there. Give you the one that you think is best for you. Tell them what you want. Fantastic. Fantastic. Thank you so much. All right, who next? Victor. Yes. Go ahead and tell us to take away from the last class. Can you hear me? Yes, your audio is good. Okay. I learned about the payment process and then the five rights of um, procurement, which leads to value for money. So I was able to understand better how we can actually um, understand the process and objective of procurement yeah. for the organization. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, Arnold Emmanuel, do you want to speak? Adela Adetayo. 
maybe Jada, Shakir, we show back here. Uh, who hasn't spoken again? Maritza, yes, go ahead. Let's hear from you in class. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Uh, from the last class, I learned about the procurement process, what you need to do, you identify the need, then you build it into a scope of work before you go ahead and your request and review the request and all that. Then, and when you start the contract, you don't over supervise or own, don't under supervise also. And I should think that was my major takeaway. That's it. That's good enough. Thank you so much. All right, Davy. Uh, good evening, sir. Good evening. Welcome. Thank you. Okay. Uh, well, my takeaway for last class uh, was a uh, contract negotiation. Um, uh, when you talked about when to sign the paper and when not to. And uh, also the types of contracts. I also was able to differentiate between uh, 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 procurement and purchase. Okay. Very good. Those are, those are my takeaway from my last class. Yeah, very good. Okay, let's hear from David, and I believe we can wrap with that. Take away, David. Okay. Um, good evening, sir. Good evening. Yeah, uh, so my takeaway from last class, sorry, I didn't jump from beginning, so I don't know if someone has talked about this, but my own takeaway is a contract fraud, um, which we need to understand is an intentional act to deceive a party, you know, or to cause damage, you know, um, or to make gain in a fraudulent way by taking advantage of the other party. And um, the types which can be um, as pollution, price fixing, which can be you know falsifying hiking prices, non-competitive uh, pricing, and a few other yeah cartels too, cartels, and um, some of the ways in which um, some of these things can be resolved when it happens can be mediation, arbitration, and then maybe escalation to the management. And those are for yeah. those three and uh, 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 what we call alternative alternative ADR resolution ADR. It's for conflicts, fraud in contracts. These this yes. uh, conflict resolution system does not work for fraud. Fraud has its own uh, unique solutions. First, for example, you can do segregation of powers in the organization. So it's not the same person that says, this laptop is broken, let's replace it, that will also go and buy it in the market and pay for it, right? So let it be different duties for different people so they can watch themselves. Then mm -hmm. that's one. And then they also have, organizations have what they call authorization matrices, right? Where you have, if it is more than this amount, it is beyond your pay grade. Uh, the person who is in that pay grade, you need to refer to that person to a review. If it's more than a certain amount, maybe a committee or the board would need to approve. That way, it allows more people to look into the details of what's going on in the contract. And then the uh, final approach to uh, fraud is to put a variation management mechanism in the contract. Instead of blocking out, oh, there cannot be any variation, instead, put a system for managing variation. What can cause a variation? Who can initiate a variation? What are the considerations that must be followed? What risk analysis must be done? Uh, who can approve the variation? You understand? If you write those things for the contract, what it does is that it helps to reduce the tendency to want to accept a cheap low bid and then hope to use variation to get more money, which is one form of contract fraud, OK? OK, all right. Thank you, sir. You're welcome. Well, you, catchy. you want to give us a takeaway from last class? Good evening, sir. Good evening, class. Good evening. Okay, so my takeaway from the last class was the difference between purchasing and procurement. I didn't know there was a difference like that. 
I thought it was just from Germany. I didn't know it was a different thing. Was from German, so I learned that, and then I learned the objective of procurement, the objective, and then the value of money as well. Very good, value for money. Very good, thank you very much. James Weaver, do you want to say something today? James, are you there? James Weaver. Okay, Tim Topa Arabia care. Take away from the last class. I know that I've called uh, Shakiru's name three times. Apparently, he's not in class, just on ghost mode. All right, so if that's all we have, I would like to find out if we have any issue for resolution um, in the uh, solution session. Anybody have a challenge you want to bring up? Does it have to be about- Sorry, sir, can I ask the question? Yes, you can ask a question. This is the time for that. Right, so it's just relating to contract fraud. I want to ask if this is a fraud or not. Assuming you are a facility manager and you you are given a repair to do. Maybe your 14 inches killer pipe is leaking. So you want to repair it for the you want to repair the leakage. Now contractors came to bid for the repair. So you are now telling each contractor that okay, I will help you push your bid if you will give me so 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 amount from how much whatever you are. Wherever you are presenting, okay, if you can give me maybe like from the bid you are presenting, you are presenting a bid of maybe like two million. From that two million, I have maybe like three hundred thousand naira is my home. I can help you push it if you give me that. So can you tell that as a fraud? That is a classic fraud. That is number one fraud. <laughs> you know why? You know why? First, there is conflict of interest. Two. That 300 dollars is coming from your company. So your company is being, is being defrauded because the contractor is not going to give you his money or manufacture money from the team air. That money is going to come from the money he's going to get from the contract, which means the company could have paid 1.7 for that job comfortably instead of 2 million. So that is a fraud of, which I would like, or is it collusion now? Uh, well, I think it's collusion too, because Basically, that is the amount you should have negotiated that job down with to so say, ah, this is your two million is too expensive. As a company, we want to pay 1.7. We don't want to pay uh, two million so you can save this 300,000. But instead, you are colluding with him to say, don't worry, I will accept it at two million, push it to the company to get it approved if you give me 300,000. That is criminal. So we see, when I say FMs, we are in a, we are in a very, very corrupt environment. In fact, our professions is termed, our professional associate managers is termed as the most corrupt, specifically because of the multiple opportunities and temptations that befall us on a daily basis. It's multiple. I give you an example. HRO spends more than FM, but HRO just processes probably uh, uh, payroll, uh, working funds. You know, once in a while, they, 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 they go transaction, but it's not like FM, diesel supplies for consumables of uh, uh, cleaning materials, maintenance contract, all forms of repair that shop, pop up every day. So the FM is always exposed to opportunities of fraud. It takes, it takes a disciplined individual, a focused professional, an ethical minded person in FM not to be fraudulent. I'll tell you a funny story. When I was growing up as, an, as a young FM, I had this young, beautiful lady I wanted to get married to. I was so excited. I was in love and I said, I must marry this girl. I went to her mom, you know, at the cost of trying to know the family and, and, and so on and so forth. She was the director of public, public prosecution for one of the states in Nigeria. And as we were talking, something led to something. And she says, but you are a facility manager. And I said, yes. I was so proud to be a facility manager. She says, but the general perception is that facility managers are thieves. And I felt like somebody poured cold water on me. So I explained carefully to her. One, I was working for a religious organization. I had the highest ethical standards. And finally, I had a very good paying job. I mean, think about it. Fresh from school, I was earning more than 200K. 
That was my first job. In fact, I didn't think of taking up a job before until somebody called me up and said, this one you are doing business up and down. Do you want to take up a job? I said, well, if you pay me more than 30K, I will leave my business and come and join your, your organization. And then they gave me my offer letter and they said it was basic of 72K. But when the pay started coming in, it was 208K. That was my first day check. So I felt, ah, I have enough money. For that money, could buy me a car then. I'd actually concluded buying an SUV, a Tokumbo one, you know, a manageable one with one month's one month salary. So I told her, I said, no, 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 no. You are not, you are not looking at a thief. This guy here is, is straight. Um, I will make sure that the daughter is well cared for. I didn't marry her again eventually, but the long and short of it is that when I got into FM, I realized what she was saying. I didn't know what was really, what was really going on until one instance where it got to a point where I just couldn't, you know, um, play along the whole game of taking the cuts here, taking the cuts here, having your hand in the cookie jar. And I had a boss who would always tell me, go and give this person a job, go and give the person a job. You know, at some point, and I said, no, I don't expect to give jobs when I don't need those work to be done. He says, no, create the job and give it to them. And I said, no, that's not going to happen. We had this back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. And I can tell you, it was a, it was, it was a, it was a tough, tough battle during that period. It got to a point where when I couldn't push any further and, and stand on my own and defend, you know what I did? I said, okay, one, my own approval limit then was, I think a thousand dollars. That was my approval limit. If it goes more than a thousand dollars, it goes to him to be the one to award. So I made it a point of duty to make sure that there was no small job around me. So anybody pipes down, give him work. I'll make sure that the job was scoped to be large enough to be above my approval limit. And in one year, my own area, my own FM group was over by $5 million. My own spending was over by $5 million. When the, when the investigation came and they probed everybody, do you know who went for it? It was my boss. I was not scratched. I wasn't even given a query, let alone, I didn't answer any question about that overspending because I maintained my sanity. I maintained my, my, my dignity. I maintained my ethical position throughout the entire process. I just made sure that I would not be messed up. There was a time they were auctioning stuff that we wrote off as FM, you know, all these sofas and things. In it. And I said, I wasn't going to bid for it. People thought I was going crazy. Why won't you bid for it? You, you can, play, you know, I could easily say, I can place a bigger offer because I know the value so the organization can get more money. I wasn't going to bid for it. Let others bid for it. Instead, I bid it for vehicles that were coming from the logistics department. And I got, you know, a, a vehicle that I paid for. But FM uh, scraps and FM write-offs, I wouldn't bid for it. It's, it's a choice that we have to make as facility managers. Our organizations are bleeding under this fraud, fraudulent activity that's going on in our organizations. The organizations are bleeding. And you know what? When the chips are down, the companies will, when they want to ask for cut costs, you know what they go to? They go to FM first. If they try to cut your expenses and they cannot cut the expenses, they'll cut you out of the organization. Because that's the truth. They see you as the one bleeding the organization. You must, you must change that narrative by one, being transparent, fully accountable, and two, being 100% ethical. Don't be involved in anything that's going to give you any kind of gain of your own person. Okay. Thank you for that, uh, Muritala, for that question. That's a very uh, important question that we needed to answer. Let's hear from Oyekachi your question, please. It's a very good one. We just pray for us. <laughs> yes. It's not easy. I don't know my colleagues. I know. But it's not easy to add it up with prayers. Yes, sure. Sure. And, 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 and the truth is, once we, make, once we make up our mind that we want to be, we will, we will excel professionally. You know, so if we, you cannot be um, uh, depending, watching your back and doing paper manipulation and figure manipulation and also be growing professionally. That's what I want you to do. Focus on improving yourself professionally and you can rise to any extent and earn any kind of amount. That's the truth about our FM profession. Uh, oh, yeah, go ahead, please. Okay, thank you very much. So, about the fraud, I don't understand it. Like, I basically didn't take anything away from that particular section of the write up. And then, when I was trying to read my book, I still didn't understand it. So, I wanted you to come on. Thank you. So, 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 if you as an FM 
the company says, go and fix this, it's broken. What you will normally do is, you will write a description of the problem, a scope of the solution, and you pre-qualify certain vendors, and you give them those two items to say, um, bid for the repair of this item for us. Your goal is to get that job done using what? Best value, right? Which is um, uh, the right product at the right time at the right price, right? A one naira more will not be best value for the organization. All right. Now, if the bids are coming in one by one and you receive the first bid, you checked 600,000 naira. When the next bid comes in, 650,000 naira. You now remember that you had a friend who is interested in this job. You want him to also bid. You now call him. Please, this is the job we want to do. Make sure you don't bid up to 650. The lowest so far is 650. What are you doing? It's fraud. If you bid 649 to win the job, you have deceitfully um, uh, removed competition and given him an unfair advantage. That's number one, right? Number two, if the vendors themselves now found a way to know the three of them, now found a way to over a beer pilot discussion. Now say, oh, so how much are you going to bid? 650. How much will you bid? 700, okay. So this time, let me win it now. Let me bid 600 so that I'll win it. Next time, when you are going to win it, uh, me, I will bid higher. The next man will also bid higher. You will bid the lowest, right? They will not be arranging those things behind your back. That is also fraud, but it's coming from outside. So fraud could be, the FM inside manipulating the system to make profit for either himself or his friends or his family, right? Or people outside forming cartels and doing price fixing to ensure that the lowest price is not competitive pricing. And then finally is the issue of contract management using variation. Somebody wins a job, 500,000, he starts doing the job. First week, crop up one variation, 600,000, approved. Next week, crop up another variation, 300,000, approved. What are you doing? You are now using a 500,000 approval limit for one job to award and execute a job of almost 2 million using variation as a creeping tool. That is also fraud. If I give you a 500,000 job and I didn't do my due diligence well, and I see a variation at 600,000 that is coming, I will cancel the job. I will suspend it and I will rebid that difference. You must be ready to rebid a process if you know you have made a mistake at the onset. And quite honestly, some vendors who have already won the job for 500,000, when they hear you want to rebid it, they will tell you don't rebid it. I will manage and find a way to do it. You know why? Because they know that they already have a good margin on what they want to do. And this other variation is sometimes already implied that they could have done. But because they see a loophole, if you're not specifically correctly or, uh, or in details in the work you gave them, they will not want to exploit. If you tell them you're going to rebid it, many of them will reverse their action and try to get the job done uh, in the other, other price. So my point here is we as facility managers, we are the custodians of our organization's fortunes. We are the ones that actually contribute to profitability because if the organization makes more money and we spend more money, especially when we waste the money and not provide value, we are reducing the organization's profitability. So fraud is anything we do to make our organization lose money, to make anybody in the bidding process lose money, and especially to make somebody take an unfair advantage over another, either one vendor over another vendor, either you as an FM over a vendor, or your organization losing money to a vendor is all part of fraud, provided it was willfully thought through and, and some kind of financial uh, manipulation took place on the paper, in the paperwork to make that happen. That is fraud. Our job is not only to understand contracts, but to understand that contract fraud exists. Even if we are not involved in the fraud, we must be blocking the fraud. You know when I was telling you that don't allow vendors know that they are all bidding for a certain job. You can't, you can't send one email to five of them, say to A, B, C, five of you respond to this bid. Don't try that. Because the moment you send that out, they will connect with each other and have a discussion 
Some people even accept to be a subcontractor to the next one, just <laughs> so that the price can be, because if the margin is high enough, they will cooperate to rip your company up. And all you do is take the lowest one and go and file it and say the lowest one I want. That lowest one may not be best value because of the value loss. People are going to share that difference and you created an opportunity. That's the fraud, you're participating in fraud. Okay. Thank you, sir. All right, thank you so much. I'm going to share my screen now so that I can get into today's class proper. I believe you should be seeing my screen now. Okay, I believe you are seeing my screen now. Yes, we can see the screen. Okay, very good. Yes, sir. Fantastic. So today we are looking at facility management organization. And in this class, we want to uh, discuss the various models deployed within the FM industry. And, uh, and, and, and talk about organizational structure that helps you to perform uh, your, your, your duties. Uh, Haji, your hand is up. Let's hear from you. Sorry, I was just trying to say we can see your screen. Okay, okay, thank you. That's <laughs> all right. Well, okay. So, 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 when you get um, an FM operations to run, there's usually the need to uh, bring people into the operations. You need to organize them. You need to staff the, the organization. Uh, you need to give them assignments, job descriptions. You need to assign various roles. The whole idea is to ensure that you are able to produce a service that that job, um, um, uh, that team is supposed to uh, deliver and ensure that everybody pulls together. Creating that organization requires you to fully understand the, uh, the various models that currently exist. Whether you are a facility management organization where you are a service provider, what we call a, uh, 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 an FM service provider, or you are a demand organization or the client organization where you are working in the company that is using the service. Um, either way, you need to have an understanding of how to set up uh, teams and how to organize your, 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 your organization. And then your own departmental organizational structure has the way it, it uh, uh, relates with the organizational structure of the entire uh, business. And that's what we're going to be looking at in today's um, in today's class, and because we we're just coming through from the um, from the uh, uh, procurement and contracts class, um, and all of those talk about outsourcing. This class is also focusing on uh, the various models you can use to outsource your FM service, so that we can see how the, ver the different companies we have out there, uh, how they organize themselves to package their services for us to uh, book or buy from them when we want to outsource our services. So we're gonna look at looking at FM organizational levels and resource impacts on performance and costs. Uh, we're gonna look at FM organizational models, uh, um, um, three or four models. And then we're gonna look at organizational structure generally, um, both the organizational structure of the entire business and that of our own FM uh, department. We're gonna look at integrated facility management and total facility management and discuss major drivers of this kind of outsourcing in the FM space. So it's important that as facility managers, you, well, our careers typically start at the operational level. Most people don't start their careers at the strategic level. You don't, you don't often come out of secondary school or have a diploma or a degree and be made the strategist or the top uh, uh, level. You start at the operational level. And at the operational level, basically what you are doing is hands-on. You are either a specialist or you are a, uh, 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 someone who has some, uh, some skills that can be used to 
perform certain direct activities that um, that is in the shop floor. Okay, so the shop floor is where the services are actually being produced or provided to the clients. So if I was a cleaner or clean supervisor, if I was uh, a maintenance supervisor, a maintenance uh, a person, a, a security guard, security supervisor, if I was an FM supervisor, if I was, you know, just about anything that puts you in front of the service delivery, where you are actually at the point where services are being delivered to clients. So even for city managers, when you are managing a site directly, whether a head office or a small uh, a branch, doesn't matter, you are doing operational activities. As you progress in your career, you begin to have more responsibilities uh, placed on you. For example, you start having uh, a, 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 a powers to hire and fire. You start having powers to uh, be able to come up with budgets um, for subsequent years, being able to do some capital planning, uh, being able to do uh, uh, technology deployment, being able to do uh, service level agreement development, being able to develop certain uh, 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 project plans to execute them and implement, you know, all of those uh, plans and so on and so forth. And then you move up to the strategic level. At the strategic level, you are no longer involved in tactical planning or operational level planning. You are basically doing more strategy. So you decide things like the uh, strategic facility plan. We did that um, um, a month ago, um, how to come up with a strategic facility plan, where you look at uh, business drivers, where you look at uh, uh, SWOT analysis of your organization, where you look at long-term vision and mission of the organization, when you look at strategic objectives that aligns with the corporate objectives and come up with KPIs that helps you to translate uh, uh, strategic objective at the corporate level to strategic objectives at the uh, FM department or unit level. Those are the kind of things you are doing at the strategic level. You are developing, um, uh, making decisions about what technology to adopt, uh, what contracting models to, to, to deploy, uh, what kind of skills to uh, bring in, how to design processes, you know, but that's basically uh, 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 what you are doing as, as you rise up. So what do you think will um, be the strongest factor so you being able to rise from the operational level where you are still doing um, uh, uh, accounting for inventory in stores, uh, taking diesel logs and, and, and you know, settling quarry between two technicians and so on and so forth, all the way to strategic level where you are now taking big high level decisions. You have to begin to already uh, develop the ability to analyze, come up with uh, business cases, come up with uh, 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 strategic analysis, even when you are at the professional level, that's what's going to make uh, management begin to see your value and begin to elevate you gradually to the strategic level. But why we are talking about this is the fact that at the operational level, there seem to be a lot of resources, people, and systems. So what it means is that, and, that, and, and pay, attention, pay attention to these two um, uh, triangles, these inverted triangles. Um, so at the operational level, there are more people. So you could have one general manager uh, managing series of facility managers who are at their tactical level. And then you have the shop floor team that, so it could be a, a, a resource pool, like one at the top, five um, at the middle, and probably a hundred or more at the bottom, right? Now, but if you, if you want to have very high performance, high quality results, and you want to have efficiencies, both in costs and uh, quality considerations, you need, to, you need to take decisions at the strategic level. Decisions made at the operational level will give you the least efficiencies or effectiveness outcomes. Okay, so that's why that this uh, uh, image is like this. You need to take decisions at the strategic level. So the results from good thinking, from good actions, from good decisions taken at the strategic level is big. That's why that's like a pyramid at the top, right? And then you have at the operational level, people are basically operating by roads. You tell them what they do, they do it. If you expect them to be the one taking all of the high level decisions that will make impact on our work, 
then you can see the kind of performance results you are going to get. That is a foundation for understanding organizational uh, uh, planning. The reason is this, one, management will focus on getting the right man at the top. Because they know that the right man at the top will give us a very high level uh, performance for the entire team or project. I don't need uh, the, all of the people at the bottom being brilliant and having one uh, 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 you know, uh, uh, irresponsible person at the top of, the, of this pyramid, because then what's going to happen is that there will be no leadership, there will be no logic around what they are doing, there will be no order, there will be no processes for them to deliver what they are doing. With their smartness at the bottom, the impact is going to be very, very little. And that's why you see some organizations, they'll be downsizing, you'll be hearing them downsizing, and they will sack people at the bottom, en masse, 3,000, 5,000, and then either they change the CEO to somebody that is earning five times what the former CEO was earning, or even the current CEO, they will pay him double. I'll be wondering, what is going on? Why are you downsizing and you are not cutting down on the salaries at the top? You know why? That is what they need to actually become more effective. What is the need for, the, for you as a facility manager? Try not to stay at the bottom. There's always that question of, is it cooler at the top or is it hotter at the top? And I can assure you, it is cooler at the top. It's actually cooler at the top. You know why? There are no competitions out there. So find your way to the top as quickly as you can by developing yourself. And not only developing yourself by studying to imbibe new knowledge and skills in yourself, by applying them to produce analysis and results and case studies that when management sees it, they know that you are putting on your thinking hats and they can use you at the top. That is how you rise. So you acquire knowledge, you acquire skills, and you apply those knowledge and skills in developing analytical results that the company can use to make um, uh, decisions that will bring uh, uh, high level results. And that's how you get promoted uh, to the top. Okay, so that's the understanding I want you to have from this FM organizational levels and resource impact and performance and cost. So I'll go straight now into the FM organization models. Uh, so depending on your kind of facility, you, you will fit into you know, one of these uh, organizational models. And we're going to talk about them one by one. You could be a customer-driven organization, most support for highest demand services, organized into business units, custom services, fast response, flexi flexibility, reviews linked to customer objectives. Some organizations have business units. They could be geographically spread, they could be co-located. But each business unit will be having a different set of uh, 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 objectives, having a different use for the facility, having different types of services they require to use the facility properly, right? And if your business is organized into such business units, each business unit will also have a profit and loss uh, uh, accounting or, or, or responsibility for that business uh, unit head. If you are working as an FM in such an organization and you are going to run facility management for all of them, you cannot use a single model for all the business units. You have to understand the resources available to them, the, uh, the, uh, the type of services they will require and design their own FM services for them. So a customer driven service is such that the customer, which is the business unit or department, they are the ones that decide what they want from you, the FM. So you could be in one organization, very big organization, and be providing different types of services for different business units and departments within your organization. I worked for a bank, I still work with them, and every now and then they will send us to go and fix a fault that has been, that has been identified in a branch, right? Um, two experiences I've had. One was we're sent to an Ikeja branch, and the uh, manager there says, well, we need this particular service from you, uh, but it's not going to fit into our current quarter's budget. Can you please come back in two weeks' time to do it so that it can fit into our next quarter's uh, spending? Those are the head office who gave us the PO, cannot say anything. All they just needed to do was, okay, please wait for them until they can have the money. Because at the end of the day, it is that unit of business or that, that department that is going to pay us. Even if the invoice will be processed at the head office in the FM office, they are actually taking money from that unit or that business unit or that branch 
to pay us. And as such, they cannot uh, uh, process a payment if their unit says we don't have money for it. So you can go and provide a service for them um, without that um, authorization or their consent. Uh, in another instance, our team went all the way to Ondo to go and fix something. And they said, no, you know what? We will live with this problem because we can't afford <laughs> to fix it. <laughs> All right, so that's customer driven. You need to be um, an FM that does not have a rigid mindset to run a customer driven environment. Your goal would be to listen to the business unit, to the department, to the unit head, to the division head, to whatever uh, uh, that structure is. You must listen intently, understand what they are trying to achieve, understand their objectives, and then develop a system that supports them. You cannot be prescribing. Again, this draws us back to the uh, price and quality. You cannot prescribe for your customers. Your customers tell you exactly what they want. All you need to do is stick to standards and regulatory compliance. So in this case, the customer-driven environment, the corporate, the organization as a whole might already have a real estate master plan or a strategic facility plan, which includes a lot of processes that is binding on everybody in the organization, right? you can use that as a tool to advise them on what is the minimum or what's acceptable or not acceptable. The options will be left to the unit heads and departmental heads to decide what is good for them or what's not good for them. Usually customer driven environments are large organizations, but then you could find yourself in a very small organization, one single office. Could be rented a floor in a high rise, could be a bungalow, could be a duplex in a, self, in a, in a fence of a, a compound. But the building will not be so much of um, uh, operations, will not demand so much operations requirement for you to now have um, uh, you know, a series of workers, technicians, facility managers, supervisors. You may not need all of those. And sometimes you are in a service block of, 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 of commercial property where you um, you, you, you are paying service charge to the landlord and you only deal with some of the things that happens within your own, your own space. You may not have enough work to be called a facility manager. So we'll probably we'll call you a, an office manager. That's the second model. It's actually for a small environment where the person that has been employed as an office manager is not technically doing only facility management. There are a lot of IT roles that will be assigned. There will be a lot of HR roles that will be assigned. So in some organizations, they call this uh, position a workplace manager, right? So you coordinate everybody's activities. You are a bit of HR, you are a bit of IT, and then you are a bit of procurement and logistics, as well as uh, FM. And most of the people that will be working for you will be outsourced vendors who come in for normal, either routine or repair uh, uh, maintenance. You will not have people on standby on salaries, for example, um, uh, working for you. You probably will have to uh, deal with just a few contractors, maybe cleaning and security, and then everything else would be um, uh, uh, on, on call uh, for those kind of vendors that would do it. Organizations that are bigger could have a single location with a very, very large site. Take the Nigerian Stock Exchange, for example, in Lagos. Um, of course, they have branches across the country now, but for so, for so many years, they had just that one edifice. It is large, uh, many floors, very complex uh, uh, mechanical and electrical systems built into it, right? So you may need to have a fully staffed environment. If you, if you compare that, maybe take a campus, a university campus, any campus at all, uh, or even a secondary school campus these days, are large enough to have a full-fledged facility management department running um, the show on a day-to-day -day basis. And in many cases, they do many of their activities, activities live, you know, direct. Um, but of course, they will also have uh, contractors who are called in to do routine and called in to do uh, call out services as well. As the organization get bigger or you find yourself in a bigger organization, you could have one location, multiple sites. Okay, so this is typical of what you have amongst the banks, uh, retail chains, uh, and so many other uh, types of organizations, church, uh, uh, church having branches across the country and so on and so forth. Uh, so you'll find a lot of control of the facility management happening at the center where the strategic facility plan is made, the facility master plans are made for each of the locations, um, uh, uh, pre-qualifications are coordinated, 
um, large procurement, especially using national buy contracts where uh, they award the contracts and vendors have to supply um, services or goods across multiple locations um, within the same city, or uh, within the same country, or within the same uh, region. Uh, beyond that, you could have the region or division led, where you have uh, a large dispersed organization in one country with headquarters and have uh, you know uh, most of their strategy, uh, planning, budget control also handled. At the, uh, at, the, at, the, at, the, at the at the at the headquarters, uh, the multinational ones have a bit more complicate complications because they have to deal with language barriers, deal with currency differences, deal with cultural uh, differences, and if you're managing a multinational environment as a strategy manager, you cannot um, just take hook line and sinker or templates from one country and drop it in the next. You can share best practices, but you have to learn how to manage the people and the resources in the various uh, countries. So what are your basics as an FM? You need to understand uh, where you're coming from. When I was talking about in the last class about um, setting the stage for outsourcing, this is not just about outsourcing. This is about you being able to understand your organization, being able to understand your business, being able to have a full grit grasp of what you've been asked to manage so the first thing you must know as a facility manager when you are managing any organization's assets is to know their business requirements what are the business drivers business drivers are things that affect the business to make it go up or down in progress or towards their goals for example revenue where are we getting our revenue from who are what kind of customers do we have and then costs who are major, uh, what are our major expenses? Okay, who are our major competitors and so on and so forth? What are the needs of the organization? The, organization's, the, organization's, the organization has teams of individuals who are supposed to perform various functions. Each of these various functions have resources uh, requirements, they will have space requirements, they will have service requirements that we as facility manager must provide for them. In providing, in providing these uh, uh, services to in providing these services to our organization, we must understand the needs of each of the business unit, the needs of each of the individuals that we provide spaces for and services for. And then what are the constraints? Constraints are the things that we need to consider that are peculiar to the circumstances that we are, uh, that we are managing. For example, uh, things like uh, 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 payment terms for contractors affecting, affecting work, things like demographics of workers, things like uh, having a process in place or not having a process in place. Uh, what about technology? Do you have the software or not having the software? You need to understand what is going to impede your delivery process. And then understand your business to the point where you know where the business is actually going. Are there changes in the horizon? Are there, uh, 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 is, is transition stable to the point where we don't expect any major uh, shakeup? In the organization if there will be should we know yes are they going to create new departments are we winning new contracts and so on and so forth fm departments should understand it because it's your job to enable the success of the organization and as such you must understand the business needs and business requirements to be able to do this job well the era of the fm just coming in to ask what do you need uh, you need water i piping water for you i need you need light i piping lights uh, i wiring lights for you is long gone i need to come in to understand your business, understand what will give you success, and then begin to work with you to like a partner to provide the solutions that is going to help you succeed. If you understand the business very well, the next thing you need to do is understand your sites, your facility data, square footages, for example, total aggregate interior square footage, total site square footage, uh, square footage of each department, square footage per person, and so on and so forth, using metrics to fully understand how many people sit in my facility, how many people do I cater for in this facility, I must know them. Is this facility owned or leased? When, I, when is this facility supposed to be on? When is it supposed to be running? Uh, what are the operations hours of this facility? Uh, types of spaces, different types of spaces um, that I have in the facility, and, and, and so on and so forth. If I, if I know all of this, um, I will be able to come up with plans and programs to be able to meet the business requirements. For example, I will know that my sites, my facilities 
um, is not going to be adequate in a few years because of the way the business is going um, uh, uh, right now. Or the kind of service I'm providing right now will not be adequate anymore because of the demographics of my uh, uh, workforce of that organization. For example, we don't have a crutch and people are going to be uh, having babies and, 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 and the place is going to be uh, uh, increasing um, uh, in, in, in number of women working for us who are uh, you know, getting married and having uh, babies. What do we do with productivity in the next few years? So the FM needs to know, these are the facilities I have. How will these facilities that I have meet the requirements of the business? And then you look at the services that you provide. So the two things that we provide as FMs are basically space and services. So in looking at this uh, outline of know your basics, I know the business, I know the spaces we have, I know the spaces we will need because I know the trajectory the business is going now. What services am I going to provide for the spaces and the people of the business? The FM needs to understand that uh, what parts of these services are provided by the landlord, some service charge that we paid as part of rent, which one are provided by contractors, which ones do we have service level agreement with the building users with? Which ones do we have service level agreement with the uh, contractors for? And if we have those service level agreements in place, is there alignment between the service level agreement that we have with contractor and the one we have with the in-house building users? Then uh, 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 we need to understand the kind of the number of people we have in various positions, uh, uh, you know, both in our own in-house uh, in team and in our contracted team. We need to also have a series of processes in place to ensure that the services are delivered. So we talk about standard operating procedures, for example. We talk about statement of works, for example. They are basically tools to help us design, uh, describe, and deploy services. Do we have them in place? If, there is, if they are not in place, what can we do to begin to put processes in place? These are the things we are considering. As a facility manager, you spend time. I told you that your goal is not just to provide services at the shop floor. Your goal is to provide services that has the highest impact, which, is, which means it has uh, uh, key performance, it's meeting up with key performance indicator requirements. And you as an FM, it's also rising in your career because you are moving up the hierarchy to strategy if you understand uh, this, because the choices you're going to make, the management analysis you are going to uh, uh, come up with is going to be dependent on your understanding the business, understanding the spaces you have, understanding the services that you're providing for the various stakeholders within the business. And then key uh, 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 basic for an FM is cost. Costs going forward should be forecasted and budgeted. Costs of the past, should be trended. The reason is that for you to make decisions about costs in the future, you must understand how costs in the past have run. You must understand the kind of value you've been getting from the cost that you spent in the past and have a sense of what kind of tweaks you're going to put in the system to ensure that your future costs are not going to run, um, uh, run haywire or become an impediment to the organization's progress. But the, the reason you are doing all of this cost data from historical to current to future or forecasted costs is so that you can have metrics that you can use for measuring your performance. No organization will celebrate you as a successful facility manager doing very well in your job if your costs are not curtailed, not controlled, not benchmarked, cannot be uh, 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 compared to best practices because your services are well and your service are well and good, um, but we're paying too much for it. That does not make me give you kudos for high quality service. And that's the whole idea that we're trying to uh, uh, get our heads around here. You must understand the cost. You must understand um, uh, how to manage um, uh, departmental finances as an FM. For example, uh, working fund is given to the FM department to spend on buying petty expenses um, and, and, and minor uh, items. You know how to retire those funds and get more funds. These are some of the things that we talk about when we are dealing with costs. And then we also need to take care of performance issues. This is very important. Many FMs go through their entire career at best understanding service level agreements and being able to come up with service specifications and service levels. Those are how services are delivered. They don't answer the question why. 
Why is answered by key performance indicators. Key performance indicators is what links your SLA to the organization's objective and asks the, and, ans, and provides answers that shows the relevance or criticality of those services to the highest level. For example, a bank is, is a bank. They do money transactions, they give out loans, they take deposits and so on and so forth. How does an FM's work support the objectives of that bank? How does your work as a faculty manager uh, uh, providing the uh, uh, right kind of spaces, servers, and, and, and services to ensure that the bank can make a lot more in terms of revenue from loans and revenue from deposits. That is what the FM needs to answer. And those are the kind of things that KPIs um, address. For example, the bank has a high level goal to make so much profit, right? If I continue spending the way I'm spending, can that profit be attained? If I'm able to smartly work my budget and work my cost management uh, 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 approaches uh, effectively, and I save X amount, that X amount can it be found in the profit? Can I be seen to be controlling or contributing to that profitability of the organization? So that's very important. We must elevate our thinking, first understand service level so you can deal with service level issues, get work done at the base. But then you also need to understand key performance indicators because this is how to get uh, 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 what you are doing, show that you are providing value to the organization at the highest level. And then deal with regulatory issues. You must understand all the licenses, all the permits that you must have in your facility. You cannot be ignorant of them. In Lagos, for example, there are tons and tons and tons of permits and licenses and regulatory compliance issues that an FM must uh, comply with because if you don't know and you don't uh, 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 comply with them if anything happens tomorrow and your facility is shut down the entire business will be affected and when that happens the fm will be the one that has caused the business uh, brought business to such ruin or disrepute so now i'm going to look at the components of organizational structure um, uh, we're going to look at uh, uh, structure and culture, centralization, chain of command, span of control, line or staff management, uh, functional and structural versus matrix models, owned or leased properties, special differentiation, standardized or specialized services. Some of it, some of this we've talked a little bit about, but I'm going to uh, 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 kind of uh, uh, expand on them, and then we're going to look at uh, relocation and churn. So let's start with chain of command versus span of control. Chain of command is the levels of reporting authority between a job position and top authority, often vertical. So it's, it's, um, it's, it says it can be horizontal or vertical, but it's, chain of command is often uh, vertical. So you have the top authority like the MD, and then you have a, a GM reporting to him, and you have managers reporting to the uh, GM, and then you have supervisors, coordinators reporting to the um, manager. Those are what we call a chain of command, right? Now, but the horizontal one is what we call the span of control, the number of people reporting to a position. So if I talk about a general manager uh, being directly under a, a, an, a, an MD, for example, and having five managers reporting to that general manager, that is called uh, a five uh, level uh, span of control for that general manager. And if there are three general managers reporting to that MD, for example, then the MD has a span of control of three. In essence, the people that you directly supervise or manage are called your span of control. Okay, number of subordinates reporting to a given manager, uh, you know, depending on the tax maturity and job complexity. Let's look at line versus staff management. Line management is vertical chain of command with specialization increasing lower in the hierarchy. So when we take the uh, chain of command and run it into a straight line down arrangement where you have the generalist at the top and the specialist at the bottom, then you are looking at line management. So you could have a, 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 a facility manager and then you have um, a soft service coordinator supervisor and a hard service coordinator supervisor, and then other the hard service, you now have uh, electrical uh, 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 technician and then a mechanical technician, you know, and so on and so forth. What you have done is at the top, you have the generalist 
who understands everything at the bottom, who can manage people, um, who can get results from the work of people at the bottom, and then all the way down to the electrical technician uh, who is hands-on specialist for electricity uh, management and, and tasks, right? So that's how a, a line management works. But staff management now includes horizontal chain of command that cuts across those vertical chains. So you have that um, uh, uh, FM and head of mechanical, head of uh, uh, hard services being broken into head of mechanical and head of uh, electrical being broken into, mechanical is broken into uh, uh, air, uh, air conditioning and the generators, and then electrical is broken down on and on and on until you get to that technician. That is the chain of command. But in that same organization, you could also have horizontal chain of command where you have someone like a, a HRO manager who manages HRO across all of this uh, 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 chain of uh, command, these vertical chains, or an accountant or a finance uh, person who supervises or manages. So you have that person being on the side, but having oversight over people across the various uh, uh, chain of commands. Now, when you, when you have that kind of structure, we call that a metrics, um, a metrics uh, uh, model. So, and this works when you have um, FMs and HSC, FM uh, and, um, and project managers, um, you have FM, account, FM, HR, FM, procurement, you have probably several FMs and have one procurement team serving all of them. That becomes a, uh, a matrix organization, especially when you now have someone maybe from the procurement department being embedded in every FM team. So if this FM team, uh, maybe the Lagos region of your organization needs any procurement, they have a dedicated procurement personnel. That dedicated procurement personnel is seen as a member of the Lagos region FM team, but reports directly to head of procurement at the head office. So in essence, that person now has two bosses. One is the Lagos regional manager for FM, whom he or she works directly with in providing solutions for, the, for, for him or her. And then the head of procurement in the organization whom uh, is the direct boss or direct supervisor of that individual. That's what we call a matrix organization. Uh, why are we talking about this? Uh, it's important that we as facility managers understand the kind of organizations we work in and understand the, the way to structure our own teams. Okay, understand the way to structure our own team. Uh, I have I've seen situations where because the hierarchy in the organization has a level called manager, a facility manager cannot call himself a facility manager because that will give the wrong impression to the staff that that person has been promoted. The facility manager may be at a level of, in the hierarchy, at a level of a supervisor or a coordinator if they have created such uh, uh, additional structure with that chain of command. So if you're in such an organization, you will, be, you will have to adapt to that uh, uh, system where you're not still having things like facility supervisor, facility coordinator, facility officer, and so on and so forth. Just so you don't you know, roughen up or it's a fair with the structure because all of you are going to have complimentary cards, you're going to have signatures on your emails and so on and so forth. And you may be creating the wrong impression. If your own structure of your FM department is now conflicting with the structure of the organization. So that's the thing you have to understand about structure. Culture is a subtle thing in most organizations. It's usually that way things are done. It's not the way things are written. It's not the way things were designed, it's the actual. So if you have a way of behavior of everybody that aligns with what things that, uh, 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 principles that have been espoused by the organization, then you say the culture is a very uh, transparent or a very uh, mature culture. If there's a divergence, then you know that the culture is corrupted or, uh, or superior. Now, depending on the kind of organizational model, we talked about organizational models uh, a while ago, uh, whether it's a, a, a single office, a regional uh, uh, dispersed or large campus in one location, your, your level of centralization in decision-making need to be agreed. 
okay? Um, many organizations in the core business will have a core team at the center taking decisions for all the various branch managers. You need to understand as facility manager if you also need to adopt that same strategy. If that strategy will not work for your department, you could have your FMs assigned to the various regions, for example, empowered to take certain actions on their own and report success back to you. Okay. Um, so, uh, in, in essence, you, are, uh, you have to tinker with how much centralization, how much power do you want to leave at the center? compared to at the branches, okay? And then uh, sometimes whether your facility is owned or leased will affect your decision-making um, drastically. If you are managing a leased facility, there's a high tendency that your organization will not want to hire many people as staff in the FM department because it's seen as a temporary relationship. Employment in an organization is really seen as a permanent relationship or a long-term relationship. So if it's owned property, it will be easy to reason that we need to have a standing team that runs this place. So uh, your mission structure cannot be uh, firmed up until you, you have a clear understanding of where your organization is going in terms of its relationship with the premises that you are in or the facilities you are managing across uh, different locations. And then another big important factor to consider is a special differentiation. That is how uh, uh, geographically spread or concentrated are the various units of your organization that you are managing. If you have um, a very large campus in one location in Lagos, you're not going to be having regional FMs inside that one building. But if you have uh, 20 in Kano, five in Benin, 25 in Calabar, and maybe 18 in Makodi, and so on and so forth as branches, then you probably are thinking about how to create clusters. So you could have clusters, regional, divisional, departmental, whatever kind of uh, 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 nomenclature into your organizational structure because you understand your spatial differentiation. And then we talked about uh, 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 specialized services when we talked about the uh, uh, business units uh, requiring different types of services. If you have different types of services, let's assume you are the FM for a government, okay? And because you are the FM for the government, maybe local government, um, there are roads to care for, there are markets to care for, there are hospitals to care for, there are schools to care for. And these schools, hospitals, markets, and the rest are very many spread across the entire local government. And you are the head of FM for that local government. You are not going to produce a one FM template with one FM department of regional structure for all of those. You are going to have a market FM department. You are going to have a schools FM department because FM as a profession adapts to the profession or activity or whatever the customers that we're managing is engaging. You need to become a specialist in that particular field of endeavor to become a good FM in that area. So we're not going to have um, uh, one standard SOP that you roll out for all of those. No, you're going to have teams. You're going to have processes that are different for each of those. We call those ones specialized service approach. And because you have specialized service approach, instead of having FM for uh, uh, regions, in such a local government, for example, I cannot say the FM for Yaba and the FM for uh, uh, Ebutemeta and the FM for uh, Shomolu in this local government that we're in now and say uh, three FMs report to me as the FM of the local government. No, because the FM for Yaba will have to deal with roads, markets, schools, hospitals, and so on and so forth. I'll say no, because the services that you need to perform or deliver to each of those uh, different types of facilities are different. I want to have an FM for schools, I want to have an FM for markets, I want to have an FM for hospitals, right? So instead of having a nomenclature that says zones, I'll have a nomenclature that says specialized. If the services are standardized, the same kind of service will be deployed everywhere. I can have zones as my nomenclature. But if it's specialized, which means, you know, uh, dealing with an airport and dealing with a school and dealing with a hotel or an office is gonna be different, then I need to create a different type of nomenclature for my, for my team. 
And then finally, we need to also look at relocation and churn. Location and churn actually refers to how often movements happen within the organization. Uh, is there some kind of stability that once a facility is set in place, everybody take their position, we will work for a long period uh, under the arrangement, or are there frequent mobility? Um, even some, some FM departments have what we call move management units. They are the ones that are moving furniture about, they are the ones that make sure new spaces are created, they are the ones that make sure that space are remodeled or reconfigured to provide the needs of new people that are going to come into the spaces. I'm going to give us a little break now, and then when we come back, we'll look at the uh, functional and structural organizational model and take it up from there. Five minutes is all we're having for this break. Thank you.
Okay. So I guess we are good to continue. Back from break. Any verbal confirmation that we are back from break? We're back, sir. Okay, good. We are, we are back, sir. All right. We are, we are back, sir. All right, thank you. All right, so um, let's look at a functional uh, st structural organizational model. Top-down organizational model where uh, the, 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 the generalist is at the top and as it comes down, it gets more and more specialization until the most specialist at the bottom. If you look at this uh, sample um, uh, uh, structure, you will see the CEO having one of those that report to him is the VP of administration. Of course, you will know that the CEO probably has people reporting to him, but because we are going to show one uh, hierarchical line or vertical chain, take that of the VP of administration, uh, who has three people reporting to him, and one of them is the facility manager. Now, doesn't mean that the controller or the purchasing department manager will not have other people under them. But because we are doing this illustration of a vertical um, uh, chain of command, we pick the facility manager and say, who are those reporting to the facility manager? And then we have all of these other people that are reporting to the uh, facility manager, whether they are in-house uh, uh, employees or they are contractor staff, because this is something that is often missing in many organizational structure, you create an organizational structure and you leave out contractors that you have brought in to fill in certain obligations or performance in your department that will fulfill the requirements of the, of the users and the business. So why do you do that? So whether it is contracted or in-house, indicate it, use some kind of means to show that. But this is basically what a functional or structural organizational model um, would mean, would be. Um, now, I have been in situations where you have the facility manager now having a, a mechanical manager under him, electrical manager under him, um, civil manager under him. And then at those levels, they are now creating a, a disorganized experience for the, for the customers, where a civil a AC that's going to be installed, for example, will require a work order for civil to come and drill a hole on the wall, a work order for mechanical to come and mount it around the, the gas pipes and the drain pipe, and another work order for electrical to come and install the uh, sockets and, and line um, to power the uh, air conditioner. That creates um, a distorted um, structure, uh, structure for that organization. What you want to achieve is harmony, a unified experience for the customer. So in such an environment, instead of going um, hierarchical, functional or structural according to disciplines, you can now do it according to, according to zones or regions or clusters of customers. So instead, because I want to, I want to focus my FM department on uh, customers and satisfying the customers, I will not break my team into uh, customers in this cluster or zone or region and have my FMs broken down to that level up to the point where I can break it down to a building and have an FM in charge of a building. That FM in charge of that building will be responsible for everything that cost those customers in that building will require. So I can still have a functional, structural, additional model that will still be able to meet the requirements of my customers. So when this becomes a matrix organization, it's when my uh, functional uh, uh, top-down chain of command now has 
a horizontal chain of command embedded into it. Okay, so it's a modified functional and structural model. Both line and staff management will be in this model, and there will be dual reporting relationships um, for certain people in this uh, organization. So take the HRO uh, 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 vice president, for example, who reports to the CEO. Um, and then the FM team now has an administration staff that are assigned to them from the uh, HRO. Or you have a project, and it's a project manager who needs an accountant, who needs somebody from HR to help recruitment, who needs somebody from FM to uh, 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 subject matter expert for uh, uh, advisory on customer requirements or electrical and so on and so forth. You find those kind of situations in many organizations where someone can be in a team and having two reporting lines. That is a matrix organization. So traditionally, um, facility management is, is delivered as an in-house service. So usually they will employ somebody in charge of corporate services, general internal services, um, what do they call them? Many names, uh, admin, um, support service. You know, nowadays you can get someone called a facility manager and then it's told to develop a set of processes, uh, service or delivering this and that, uh, you know, maintenance plans. It starts working on those. The first thought that comes to your mind is you employ everybody you need. So when you need this, this is supervisor, you employ him. When you need that, you employ that. Um, you start buying stocking materials. That's you're basically maintaining in house. You will now have a small supply chain, a set of vendors for things that you will not be doing on a regular basis. So, for example, you probably will have your, your vendors for things like um, cleaning up your cutting wall, your glass on the high rise that happens once in two years or once in three years. You probably will have you know, a vendor uh, called in to come and um, unblock certain uh, uh, sludge uh, 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 blocks in your drainage pipes. If you have to deal with something like that, there will not be things that you have in-house or standby people for. Now, those are the kind of things we call the, the kind of circumstance or scenario we call the traditional in-house delivery model. Now, this traditional in-house delivery model can apply to an organization, say an insurance company or a school or a hotel, right, that does its own work in-house. Can also apply to an FM company that has taken a contract to provide these services for another organization. They can decide to employ everybody in-house because I could take a contract and still subcontract. But if I'm going to do most of the things by employing people, I still call it traditional in-house delivery model on the contractor side. So this is basically how FM is delivered at the first level. Then we begin to see some splits. We're going to see some uh, level of specialization happening, such that even at the strategic level, you can have someone minding, minding the hard services and another person minding the soft services. Because that is where they draw the line between engineers and non-engineers in FM very quite, uh, 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 quite easily, okay? And then as you begin to come down to the tactical level, you start seeing the site-based FM teams. Now, this split does not necessarily mean that the organization is outsourcing. Most banks in Nigeria still operate like this. They have managers for different types of uh, uh, functions, and then they still have teams within the bank who are in charge of providing contractors for this and that who are doing things on a, on a daily basis. Now, at this point, I would like to draw our attention to uh, two, two, what I would call categories of the FM work here. You have the management, and then you have the service delivery. Management and service delivery. Service delivery is the actual delivery operating at the operational and sometimes tactical level. Whereas management is oversight. In the traditional delivery model that we just talked about, you are holding on to management 100%. And you are also holding on to most of the service delivery by having only a specialized 
uh, non-routine items left to the supply chain. And these hard services, I mean, this traditional model is what we're still looking at when we talk about the hard and soft services split. You are only just increasing the number of people within the organization, increasing specialization within the organization, but you are still hiring people in. You still have to use specialist service supply chain. At this level, we say you are still doing things in-house. At the point you now decide to outsource more than services, you are now beginning to outsource management. That's when we enter into the integrated facility management models. If you are running a site where uh, contractors come to provide services here and there, but all the contract holders and supervisors of the various uh, jobs are all in-house, you are holding on to management and you are outsourcing service delivery. That, to us, is not integrated FM outsourcing. That is still traditional in-house way of doing things. So if you have a security company coming to provide guards, cleaning company coming to provide cleaners, a uh, plumbing company coming to come and put a standby man in your, your treatment plant and all that and all that, and you are still on a daily basis taking their logbooks and taking their reporting sheets and all that, you are not outsourcing FM management yet. The level at which you want to now begin to assess facility management is what we call integrated facility management, where both management and services can be bundled together and given to a contractor. So the first, the first uh, model, the IFM model, the first one I was going to look at is called the managing agent. In the managing agent model, you, you as the in-house FM has outsourced your services. So there's a supply chain that is doing all of the services. But now you want to also outsource supervision or management. So you get an IFM company in and say, we are going to give you a contract as managing agent. You will help us provide the supply chain, but we will still be the one holding the contract, which means the plumber company, the cleaning company, the security company also have contract. They all have contracts with us. We only introduce you as the ones going to help us provide them. That's the managing agent model. So we can say we have given you this contract um, to manage all of our services, but every time somebody does work for us, you only tell us that that person has done work for us so we can pay the person. So that means the contract is still with us. This is uh, typical of what uh, organization like uh, Shell, uh, MTN today, and some of the large multinationals are running. Because they have certain obligations with community contractors, for example, so that they can, they will always have to be the one giving out jobs to those community contractors. They cannot outsource all of the jobs to one, to one uh, 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 company. So they will bring that company in to help them supervise while they directly are having those contracts with the service providers. For some organizations, like in the case of MTN, they use that as a model to have more control over their services. Because when you outsource everything completely, and there is a slight misalignment between your strategic goals and what you want to achieve and what the contractor's intentions and motives are in your operations, you are stuck. And that can become a big problem. So when you have people at the strategic level who wants to control the outcomes, want to have control over the kind of contracts we have with the con contractors and kind of contract we have with the IFM company, then you use the managing agent approach. So you don't totally relinquish control. The next model is what we call the principal contractor. The principal contractor is the second IFM model, the second integrated facility management model. The client holds on to strategic management, but allows the uh, uh, principal contractor to run the show. All their site managers, uh, this contractor staff, they have everything in the hands of the principal contractor. The principal contractor is now the one that is required to have contracts with the supply chain. Unlike the managing agent model where the uh, client still has those contracts, in the principal contractor model, uh, the client has a contract with the principal contractor 
and the critical contractor has a contract with all the various uh, service providers. In essence, this model of IFM is what we call the total facility management. Uh, well, we, 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 we'll still have another model we can call the total facility management. This is more of integrated facility management in that the, the client has one contract, not one with the management company and many with service providers, no. He has one contract, and that is only with the management company, who is also um, in charge of all services. That's what the principal controller model is. Now, when we get to the uh, self-delivery total IFM package or total FM package, the principal contractor in this case does not is not under any obligation to contract out all of the services the way it is in the PC model. He now brings in his own staff to execute everything from the shop floor. What this means is that he's operating what we call a total facility management model. While the principal contractor is operating what we call the integrated facility management model. The IFM model of the principal contractor requires him to outsource the services at the shop floor while holding on to management and developing all the processes. But the total FM model requires him to employ everybody to work for him and be fully integrated. Now, if you reason with me when I was talking about how the client might want to have control by having the uh, contracts with the service providers and having the contracts with the management uh, agent, in this case, the contractor, which is the general contractor now, wants to have more control by employing workers himself. He doesn't want multiple um, MDs controlling what's happening in the shop floor. So it brings everybody integrated into his organization. But of course, you still have some specialist services that will be outsourced. Okay, so we have talked about the in-house traditional delivery model. We've talked about IFM, uh, 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 which is the first level at which management is being outsourced the managing agent model, where you employ a managing agent to provide management team to supervise all the contractors you have that are directly reporting or directly working for you. And then you have the principal contractor where that managing agent transforms to being the one having one single contract with the client and having all the contracts with the service providers. So taking all the service providers away from the client is what the principal contractor does. That's the third level. In the total FM or self delivery total FM package, um, that's the fourth model, the principal contractor no longer has obligations to contract out or subcontract out the services. Instead, integrates all the workers into himself and has one unified team to deliver the services. In the, um, in the, uh, in the uh, managing agent model, the client takes a lot of risk. Because if a subcontractor does not perform, there's only so far you can go with the managing agents in terms of you know, getting them to force your own contractors to do good work for you. They can teach, train, supervise, and do all that, but they can't do too much. So you as a client, in holding back that control, also hold back some of the risk that this service might fail. Right? Now, in the principal contractor model, the risk is now removed completely from the client. It's now in the head of the con general contractor. He's now, his job now is to ensure that the client has one report, one invoice. It's now his job to ensure that the supply chain can listen to him so that once he translates the SLA he has with the client into the bits of SLA for the various contractors, they listen and can deliver well. But again, he is the one holding on to the risk of the service delivery. And the, there is still a chance that some of those other contractors may fail and leading him to fail with the client. So to remove that risk of failure, he moves, you could have the total FM uh, package where he's no longer doing third party contractors whom he doesn't have you know, that kind of firm grip over. He now has people who are directly working for him in his organization who have a shirt to fight for. And that is the total FM package in FM delivery. So that's basically 
the key models when you are trying to outsource your FM. So right now you will ask yourself, what model am I currently operating? Am I doing all the management and having people who are uh, my employees and also have contractors who come in? That's traditional in-house delivery. Or am I only handling strategy? I'm no longer involved in all of those tactical plans, uh, uh, rosters and, 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 and uh, PPMs and all that. I'm not doing strategic planning and, and resource uh, allocation and allowing the uh, contractors, you know, do the uh, job and give me delivery at KPI level, not at SLA level, at KPI level. Then it means I have allowed management to go and then I'm allowing people to do the management. And then the, the three the, the different levels at that point where uh, management uh, 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 of contractors that are still mine, management of contractors that are now yours, or even getting rid of contractors and doing the job yourself as a TFM. Uh, what are the major drivers of uh, integrated facility management? Cost saving is one. Many organizations, for most organizations, FM is not their core business. And they will not be able to take advantage of cost efficiencies. An FM company knows how to get skilled staff that are paid low compared to an, a demand organization. The FM company knows how to get key resources and materials to work with compared to the demand organization. The FM company has assets for serving multiple customers that reduces the cost of those assets compared to an in-house organization trying to stock those equipment for carrying out maintenance. So cost saving is a big deal. So even if you think that the FM company is going to make profit, you as an in-house organization is probably wasting more than that profit because you don't know. These guys, they're using their knowledge to make the profit. And they're also saving you some part of that money. Improvement of operational integrity. Because this is core business for them. They have processes that have been refined over the years. Operational integrity is the alignment between what you want to achieve and what you're actually seeing on the ground. And because it's in contracts, there's a high likelihood that penalties and, and incentives will make the contractors will deliver better than your own in-house staff that you employed. You minimize risk, of course, I talked about the risk. Uh, when the contract is out, uh, you, you basically package all your risk into the contract. You drive operational excellence. In fact, as an in-house FM, where there is outsourcing of management, you learn a lot more from those uh, operational teams from the contractor side, because they will be bringing a lot of best practices uh, from various uh, industries that they work in. And then there will be improved business continuity, because what that means is that you have an outsourced party that you are doing due diligence on to ensure that they cannot fail you. Okay, so that helps you as an in-house uh, FM to, uh, 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 to be more strategic in your day-to-day -day, uh, thinking and the way you do things. Okay, so um, uh, apart from costs, uh, you also have uh, uh, being able to use expertise of the service provider. Um, they also have specialist solutions like safety that you may not have capacity for within. Uh, your customers too, we also have the, uh, 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 you know, benefits of that quality response. I mean, think about it. If we are colleagues, you know, it's just that you are here now, that's why I'm teaching you um, that you don't come to work like them, you don't come to work with them, you come to work for them, right? But that's not the reality in most organizations. You are a supervisor or manager level in the organization and you feel um, you are above those who are below you in other departments and rank. So you still carry yourself like, you know, um, you are a manager or your position in that organization. The contracted resources that come to work in your organization, they will carry themselves that way. They see themselves as servants perpetually in delivering that um, uh, service. So your customers are going to have um, improved uh, operational response times 
I mean, a, a colleague will tell you, for example, that uh, don't you know it's weekend, you are at home, and you don't expect me to also be at home and enjoy my weekend. <laughs> but the controller will not tell you that, right? So that's the whole idea of um, uh, one of the reasons why customers will get um, a better result from outsourcing, okay? Uh, and then, of course, in terms of services, um, there is scalability, so it's an easy adaptation. The contract can be uh, squeezed, can be expanded, you know, almost at will in most organizations, whereas you can't do that with an in-house department. And then, of course, you look at the processes. Management don't have to do appraisal for FMs. They don't understand what they are doing, right? So um, processes for FM work is, is given out to the FM organization to develop and bring and tell us you know, they come and do a presentation to us and teach us all the things we don't know and we are impressed that they know what they are doing and we're sure that we, are, we can trust them with our solutions, you know. So that's some of the reasons why we outsource, okay? Uh, so as a, as a facility manager, um, uh, there are some of the um, reasons why you want to uh, deliver directly. Oh. Uh, let's talk about the benefits and the limitations. Uh, less skills or knowledge to procure. Uh, cheap one invoice. We're talking about the benefits of outsourcing now. Small organization with no in-house skills will want to outsource. Uh, and then we'll look at the limitations. You, you find out that if you are trying to keep in-house um, management, you may be poor in it. I don't see a bank manager in a, in a big bank building being able to manage all the FM services in that building, being appraisals and being able to rate people and having the skill to uh, look into electrical issues and mechanical issues and human resource issues and so on and so forth. But an outsource FM will be able to provide that kind of solution for you. Some of the things you should have in place when thinking about outsourcing as facility managers, it's very key that you have your list of vendors, uh, vendors that have worked historically. I've seen situations where You've worked with some people, you've forgotten about them, you have a problem again tomorrow and you look for new people, right? Have a log of all the vendors. So even if you hand over that facility to someone else tomorrow, let there be a log of all the vendors, okay? Let there be a filing system, both digital and, uh, and, and, and paper-based for all the past contracts, including service levels that have been written in the past, uh, you know, uh, details of, of payments and costs historically in the past and how those service levels um, and performance of those contractors. Lease agreements, um, these are very important uh, documentation for FMs. Um, you must have a copy in your file of your lease agreement because there are certain terms in your lease agreement that shows that your organization has probably has paid for certain things to the landlord that the landlord is not providing and you may not know. For example, who's supposed to repair the roof when the roof leaks, who's supposed to fix external drainage when there's a failure, who's supposed to do this and that if you're in a lease apartment. And then, of course, uh, how to reach the, con the landlord, his contact information, financial data, his social costs, uh, and so on. Utility bills, you cannot. And, and then some of us just take utility bill and go and pay it and file the bill. Will know. You must have a login system that, itemize, that records how many kilowatts, how much you paid, how many kilowatts, how much you paid, and what period. So you can create a trending of your utility uh, uh, systems and then accounting requirements, uh, how funds are spent, how budgets are accounted for, and so on and so forth. You also need information on IT requirements. What kind of server does your organization uh, 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 use, for example? Some of us will just wake up tomorrow and say, oh, we want to buy this FM software. They'll come and install it for us, but the IV check whether it's compatible. Uh, what other ERP system, enterprise resource planning, or any other uh, operational systems do we have in the organization? How would the NFM software fit into it? Some of this basic information we should have. Organizational chats, it's organizational, organizational structure. Because when you are thinking of a contractor coming in or bringing in staff to come and work for you, you need to understand how to create the organizational structure of your team that will fit well into the organizational structure of the entire organization. And then you must have site information all the drawings electrical drawings mechanical drawings architectural drawings you must have for your site if you don't have it 
you need to reverse engineer the process of creating those drawings. Even if it's single line drawing, draw. Have an idea of where things are on a sketch and be able to use those sketches to scope work. For example, I can scope the tiling requirements because I have drawn and I've put the square meters and the length and breadth of every floor area. I can scope the painting requirement because I know how, how long and how high walls are in my facility. Service level requirements. This, you know, we talked about when we talked about service level agreement, we said you must first have service levels with your in-house users before you go and create service level with your vendors, right? So before you get into the point where you're creating service level agreements with vendors, first scope service level requirements from your in-house users. And you must of course have your asset register that includes all your uh, maintenance, all your equipment leasing. Your maintenance records must be up to date. At least, at least a maintenance plan, which shows the items to be maintained, the strategy for maintaining them. We we'll talked about this in this class, the uh, schedule for maintaining them, which is, that's your maintenance plan. A maintenance report, which is either using the same template to color code what was done on time, what was done late, what was never done, and having a reporting, or another sheet where you have a reporting of what was actually done. Okay. And then the logs of all the work orders that have been generated on your in your in your facility. So that the history of how fast assets are breaking down and being fixed, or how routine maintenance is taking place. You not only have the big picture spreadsheet, but you also have work orders where technicians have written their story because these are the kind of things that are going to give insights into managing those assets in the future. Building rules and regulations. So this is where you need to look at uh, engagement of people. Facility management is not just about maintenance. Engagement of people, working with people. What are the policies that govern people's use of that facility? And then you have permits all forms of permits and licenses, so many. Your borehole needs one, your generator uh, emission needs one, your elevators need one, your site planning needs one, your uh, sewage plant needs one, and so on and so forth. You need to understand the various permits you need to have in your facility. They are very, uh, 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 from simple to complex, the kind of organization you're working for. Multinational organizations who are afraid of uh, breaking the laws of a country when they come in, they will push you all out to go and get all the permits right? But many local organizations will just go for the basic ones um, that will enable them to uh, keep running and wait for the government when they come with their scapegoat um, uh, uh, enforcement strategy. Um, hope that they never catch us. Um, if they catch us, then we know that we're in for it. We'll just face the music, you know, things like that. But the best bet would be for you to get all the relevant permits to do what you need to do. For example, I had a high-rise uh, building that had a a 33,000 liters uh, diesel tank. That diesel tank requires a DPRO permit before you can operate it. Many FM don't know. You need to have a DPRO permit. And that permit, you need to, DPRO will come, they will inspect it, they will you know, do all their various work and give you a permit. Your building, public commercial buildings must have a fire permit. The fire authorities will need to come, do their audits and do a certificate and do a stamp, you know, all those kind of things. You need to have them. And the key contacts and emergency numbers uh, this could include contractors, regulatory people, fire authorities, police, and so on and so forth. And then have incident reporting procedures. If not when something happens, somebody calls somebody, somebody calls somebody, everybody agrees that there's a solution to it, we, we fix it and they will forget it. No, there must be a way to document failures, incidents, you know, in, in accidents and so on, and make them something that can be used for historical learning, learning from incidents. If you're not documenting incidents, um, you come into the organization, and that's a simple comes to some organization. You come with all these bright ideas and it starts rolling, rolling. People will just look back at you and say, hmm, this is what you're just talking about now. They've tried this in 1995, it did not work. <laughs> and you know what? The experience they had in 1995 was not documented, so you don't have a clue what uh, uh, they did wrong or what uh, made it not to work then, right? And you may just look like a fool. So the whole idea here is make sure that there's a system of documenting things uh, in your facility so that people that come in later can 
take over from where you stopped. And, and I keep hearing FM say things like, oh, when I came in, uh, I didn't meet any records. There were no processes. There was no this, there was no that. You worked there for one year, going to two years. What can we take from you if we were to move you away from there now? That would be the next question, isn't it? So the point here is go back and ask what was available and then ask yourself, how have I improved what I met or what the norm meets? So that if someone else comes in today, it is not matter of using to do handover. Handover will be full documentation that shows that this is how this place is being managed that you can roll with or progress with. And then transitioning into a, a, a IFM, there are certain things that must be done to uh, uh, move you in. First, to understand the business needs. That's what we're talking about. And then uh, every business unit must understand the change that is going to come when you are trying to outsource everything. I remember when some of the some organizations that I was part of were going to outsource, the staff were panicky. They said they're going to be fired, this and that and that and that, because there was not enough information how can you have almost 70 staff in house in FM and start rumors start filtering down? They're going to do IFM, they're going to outsource. All of them will just think they're going to be fired immediately, right? So you need to be clear uh, on how the changes, uh, what changes it will, be, it will be, and how it's going to affect them. In one of the organizations, they just made everybody clear, made everybody to know from the fiance once this contract is coming on board, you will be offloaded to the contractor on the same terms and condition as the contract you have with us for two years. So start planning your next move. See it as your resignation notice or your next agenda. At least that is a transparent approach. So the staff knows that, ah, okay, oh, last, last two years is the worst case scenario. Let me start planning my next move or start seeing how I can blend with the new um, company to work with them on a long-term basis. Those kind of things. Some people will just give you, you know what, this is what's going to happen. This is how the change is going to affect everybody. Anybody that wants to resign now will get to someone who benefits. Resign now and move on. Anybody that stays, this is what's going to happen next. So everybody have that knowledge. Um, change management is all about being able to carry people along every step of the way, you know, and that, and that requires a strong communication plan. Uh, and then the IFM service provider that is coming in must establish staff requirements and additional structure. Uh, fill open positions, provide uh, required orientation and training, and transfer knowledge from acquired or incumbent uh, staff. Because if a transition is not done, I have one case in my hand right now where the client is saying, um, take over this large uh, portfolio uh, from us. And we are saying, we want a three months transition where we will, be, where we will understand what has been happening here, where we will understand uh, document all of the things that you could not document for all these years, you've been managing it using these other people, right? And then after that, we will now fully take it over. And they said, no, we want you from the day you sign this contract to take it over and start running it. What do we know that we can start running from day one? Because there's nothing documented that we can use to plan, right? Unless we're going to just come in there and say, everybody that are here, shift to one side. We have a new team coming in and that is going to create a huge dislocation in the system. In fact, our operations will be sabotaged immediately if we try that. So there's always that transition that needs to happen and thinking through that process requires time. So that's why if you're outsourcing, try to work with whoever you have selected to ensure that there's careful and proper planning and a transition period. They can be part of the operations from transition period. You can cut it to as short as two weeks, but there must be that period where you are uh, understanding each other, you are creating processes, you are uh, selecting from both teams, you know, and then marrying them to work together. And then, of course, you must have a risk mitigation plan. Uh, what can go wrong? You need to be able to itemize things that can go wrong and plan for them. Okay, I think that's it. Um, this is like 20, this is like a repetition of what we have talked about before. I'm going to stop here and ask that you uh, look through your notes in three to five minutes and uh, put your hand up if you have a question. Um, let's have a robust discussion after this.
All right. Let's wrap this up. Anthony, you have the floor now. Chinere, you'll be next. I see your hand. Anthony, you can go ahead. Tony, you can ask a question. Uh, Tony, do you hear me? Is my audio coming through for everybody? Yeah, okay. I can hear you now, sir. Okay, please ask a question. Yeah. Okay, good evening, sir. Good evening, welcome. And good evening, class. Yeah, thanks for this session. Uh, my question is on uh, where you're talking on major drivers of IFM and uh, TFM. So I didn't get clearly, clearly the meaning of TFM, one. Then secondly, down the line, say gain economies. Is it economies or economic? Economies of scale. of scale. Economies of scale. Economies of scale is talking uh, about being able to buy in bulk, or be okay. a, when you are a big buyer, you, you take advantage of economies of scale by being able to negotiate lower prices. Um, so if, if you have a, a stationary requirement of uh, maybe uh, 10 cartons of paper per branch, and you have 500 branches across the country, it means that you probably use up four or five containers of paper a year. You understand? So if you place your order with me, uh, as a supplier, you can actually get it at half price because I will be taking you as a special customer and ordering especially for you. You understand? So that is taking advantage of economies of scale. Is IES. All right. So total FM is the TFM, total facility management. Okay, 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 yes. Okay, okay. So the IFM models will be mostly management, no execution. The the the. That is integrated facility management. IFM is integrated facility management. Exactly. TFM is total facility management. The integrated facility management model means that you are handling management. You are letting others do service rendering. In the first model, the principal, the management agent is an IFM model where the, the owner of the job is the one that also contracts with service providers. You as a managing agent, just help him supervise. That's an integrated facility management model that is common in Nigeria today. The second model is where you are a management provider, but you, you are the only one responsible to the clients. All the vendors that will provide services, you are the one that gave them the contract. So you are the one having the contract with them. Those are the two IFM models, managing agent and principal contractor. The third IFM model is actually called a total facility management model or TFM. So you can have IFM model one, managing agent, IFM model two, principal contractor, and TFM, which is IFM model three. Thank you very much, sir. You're welcome. Chair, you want to ask a question now? Yeah, thank you very much. Um, it was a very comprehensive one with a lot of semblances here and there. So I, I got it confused, but uh, you've been able to explain um, the other two, the principal contractor and the agent, um, the okay. other one that is managing agent. Managing agent. Okay, but I have, uh, at least, can you just please go further and explain this? Sub delivery total FM okay. package. Okay. And the soft, there's where I saw the soft. Uh, soft and hard service plates. Hello, Chenry. Have you asked a question? I, I lost you at the last sentence. I'm so sorry. At least, like I, I, I just went off and I'm back. Okay. Okay. Go ahead. Hello. Yes. Go ahead. Hello. 
Yeah. So please add it some some further explanations on those two. Okay. Okay. Thank you. So so um when you are doing the traditional in-house delivery where all the managers are in-house staff you could break that down into additional specialization within your team that's where we talked about the split between hard and soft services so some teams will have so if we have um, head of hsc head of uh, soft services head of hard services so we have even instead of having head of hard services they'll have head of maintenance head of projects you understand when they are doing that they are still holding all management within and it's part of a traditional in-house delivery model by the time you start outsourcing and having contractors take on management responsibility to manage for you, which means you will not have all these various managers in house. You probably have just a few people, like a finance head, uh, the FM who is in charge of strategy, you know, people at the top um, that will be handling strategy and long term planning. Everything else will not be in the hands of the contractor. If the contractor is subcontracting, we cannot call that self delivery model for that contractor. But if the contractor is not subcontracting, he's using his own people to execute the job. We call that a total FM self delivery model for the contractor. So, the same way you are doing your traditional in house delivery, that's how a contractor can take all of your work from you and be doing his own in house delivery called TFM or total FM without sub outsourcing. Okay. Okay, can I can I ask a question? A question for yes. following from what, okay from what uh, you just answered. Her. So, for example, if I have an office complex, mm -hmm. and uh, in that office complex is you have those office spaces are rented out. Yes. So I take on uh, an FM company to do everything about managing that com managing that complex. Yes. So if that FM is is a full FM company that is still working on it with their total staff mm -hmm. that's total um, total facility uh, management yes management yeah. so but if they are taking on subcontractors then it's and they are integrated facility managers yes Sorry. yes thank you very much all right uh thanks everybody i hope it's been a good class see you again yeah. on saturday bye bye uh, hi Expected soon. What can I go for? I can say go for 6:30 mass.